Hello, my name is uh, Marta Arnaldi and uh, I am the lecturer in Italian at Sentence College. I'm also a Lamin Junior Research Fellow at the Queen's College, Oxford. Um, I am originally from Sanremo, a sea town in the Ligurian region of Italy, not far from the French border. And alongside my academic work, I write and dance. Um, this is my first collection of poems, Itaca, uh, which has won two literary prizes. So in this video, I would like to outline the postdoctoral research I am working on, uh, which is called Translating Illness. And that we also introduce its sister project, Translating COVID-19, which I developed in the first months of the pandemic. Let me start with the image of a film that has stayed in my memory. The 1998 film Sliding Doors, directed by Peter Howitt and starring American actress Gwyneth Paltrow, follows two parallel storylines, which show the divergent paths that the protagonist's life could take, depending on whether or not she catches a train. In the past months, I have been haunted by the realization that we are, just like this character, continuously asked to make a choice between the real and the virtual, the vigilant and the impulsive, the rational and the absurd. The outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic has certainly diverted our journey, but is there a right train? As a former student of medicine and a scholar of comparative literature, I've always been fascinated by the ways in which the physical and the mental worlds interact with and shape one another. Translation is a vital vector of this exchange. We translate to replicate ourselves, protect our life, and communicate to people who could not otherwise understand or being understood. Sometimes, through the invisible paths of contagion and trauma, translation can even make us ill. So I have become interested in these apparently unrelated, if not opposite, meanings of translation. And therefore I've asked myself what different concepts and practices of translation have to do with one another and to what extent translation in the scientific sense, and here I am thinking about the disciplines of translational medicine, the processes of knowledge translation. So to what extent the translation in these scientific meanings is different to the ways in which we relate to a foreign language or to a foreign culture? I created Translating Illness to explore these ideas. So, supported by a LAMI Fellowship at Queen's, uh, this interdisciplinary project was awarded a triple grant from Sentence College Research and Travel Fund, Welcome Institutional Strategic Support Fund, and OUP Oxford John Feld Fund. These grants helped me undertake, alongside primary research on modern poet translators, writing and translating from and to different languages, a series of research with uh, public engagement activities. And I will mention some of them because they are key uh, to this project. So in October, 2019, I was writer in residence at the University of Uvascula, Finland, where I delivered a masterclass in creative writing in the foreign language, which for me and the other students was English. In January 2020, I inaugurated a seminar series at Oxford, which was then turned into podcast episodes. And in March 2020, I took a plane for New York uh, to start a visiting fellowship at the Department of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. Other planned visits included archival work at the Yale Biniki uh, Rare Book and Manuscript Library, a translation workshop to be delivered at the University of Central Florida, and then invited lectures at Princeton. But things went differently. So as alarming news were coming from China and my home country, Italy, 
I came to terms with the fact that my project was no longer a theoretical matter. It was in fact an articulation of the global crisis we were living through. Coronavirus disease had become the illness we were asked to translate. I activated translating COVID-19 as an emergency response to the pandemic. I designed and hosted a series of five video conversations with world leading experts in translation studies and epidemiology with the aim to discuss the translational implications of coronavirus disease. The episodes, which scored almost 3,000 views in five months, touched upon questions of race, conspiracy, and lack of medical evidence connected with the current health, ethnic, and environmental crisis. In the first episode, Nicola Gardini, professor of Italian and comparative literature at Oxford, invited us to reflect on the language we use and the metaphors we resort to in order to capture the ineffability of illness. The second episodes in the series featured Charles Fosdick, James Barrow, Professor of French at the University of Liverpool and HRC theme Leadership Fellow for Translating Cultures. Professor Fosdick highlighted the ways in which translation creates connections that protect us from isolation, both on public and private levels. He explored the many meanings the experience of confinement has taken across different linguistic, societal and ethnic contexts, thus tackling issues of mental health, class and race. A similar attention towards non-dominant languages and cultures has characterized Professor Karen Thornben's contribution, which disclosed the role literature in translation plays in retrieving examples of non-Anglo-Euro-American medical practices. Karen Thornben, who is Harry Tuckman Living Professor in Literature and Professor of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at Harvard, proposed a solution to the health environmental and racial issues gripping our society by tracing the model of a world policy of care. And uh, her newly published book, Global Healing, Literature, Advocacy, Care, came out with Brill this year. In the fourth episode, I dialogued with Eivind Engelbretson, Professor of Interdisciplinary Health Sciences at the Institute of Health and Society, University of Oslo. Professor Engelbretson offered the perspective of a scientist, scientist invested in humanities research that is not secondary, but fundamental to clinical advancements. He pointed out that medical discoveries, policy and practices are cultural determined. Despite our common perceptions, science does not provide universal truths. And this is particularly evident in the case of face masks, for example. The final episode was dedicated to the transnational past of contagion seen through the lens of 20th century cinema. Kirsten Oster, the founder and director of the Medical Humanities Program and the Medical Futures Lab, at Rice University, Texas, drew on her expertise as a media scholar, health researcher and technology analyst to discuss visual culture's paradoxical power to represent the invisibility of infection. So as emerges from this overview, translating COVID-19 has, has been a profoundly collaborative endeavor one that proved to be as much challenging as enriching. It made me travel to unspecified destinations on a train I did not plan to catch, but on which I was not alone. I would not thank the virus or months of social distancing for this serendipitous diversion. Rather, I would like to acknowledge the support of colleagues and mentors who make academia a place of renewal and transformation and whose work shows us the many ways in which we as humanists can be humanitarians and perhaps even medics in the face of the unknown. 
Sometimes we have no control over which train to take, yet we can decide how and why to wander.